What I want to do in our time here this morning is I want to try to convince you that the way that we have traditionally explained the causes of the Great Depression is ultimately dangerous. Because what we've done oftentimes is we have tried to come up with one cause, right? The silver bullet, the thing that caused the Great Depression. And then if we just fix that, everything will be fine. But just like life, uh, the Great Depression is not so simple. It's much more complicated and much more complex. And I think it's important that your students understand that the Great Depression was so complicated and so complex, so that maybe they will then also get a better understanding that life is oftentimes so complex and so complicated. And just like with life, we have to be very, very careful when something goes wrong to think that there's one simple solution for our problem. There usually isn't. When something majorly goes wrong, there's usually not one single cause. Instead, it is usually a collection of things all going wrong at once. And it is ultimately dangerous to think that there's just one thing. And so if we solve that one thing, our problems will be solved. That's not true. And so it is with the Great Depression. So in doing so, what I first off wanted to lay out is how we used to think about the Great Depression. And then I want to move on to talk about how we think about it now and the complexity of it, but also to help us by understanding the Great Depression, give us a better understanding of some of the problems that we face today. And I'll try to leave some, some, some time for Q&A. Right, so the way we used to think about the Great Depression is that it revolved around the stock market. Right, we've got the stock market crash of 1929, that causes banks to fail, and with the failure of the banks, then the economy slides into the Great Depression. Right, the idea was that commercial banks oftentimes lent money unwisely to stock market speculators. Right, so we have these speculators, these people betting that the prices in the stock market would continue to increase, or we had other speculators attempting to corner a market, buy up the majority of the outstanding stock to be able to control the price. And that worked so long as stock prices continue to increase and increase. But then when the stock market crashed, the speculators could no longer repay their loans to the banks. This traditional story went. And thus, when the depositors of the bank showed up and wanted their funds back, the bank said, sorry. Uh, or they didn't say sorry. They basically closed their doors. But they said, essentially said, sorry, we don't have your money. We lent them to the stock market speculators, and they can't pay you back. And there, of course, up until 1933, there was no deposit insurance, right? The banks all insured themselves, and they essentially insured each other. And so when the bank runs happened, all the depositors showing up at the bank at once, all of the banks failed. So thus, it was oftentimes described that the banking system was the equivalent of just putting a roulette wheel in the bank lobby, right? That you go in, you put your money into the bank, well, it's like betting on the roulette wheel. If you're lucky, when it comes time for you to withdraw the money, the money's there. If you're unlucky, then the bank doesn't have your money, and oh, too bad, you starve. So the idea was that the collapse in the stock market was related to the, 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 the failure of the banking system, and that's what caused the Great Depression. There is an element of truth to that. As with all kind of oversimplifications, it starts, in fact, in some type of, of truth. But the ultimate truth is much more complicated and much more complex. And so we have to be careful with this obsession and this focus on the collapse of the stock market and the banking system causing the Great Depression. It wasn't that simple. It's going to play a role. It's going to play a, 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 a significant role, but it's not the complete story. And so what ultimately we're going to be left with, and we can discuss this, is, is it possible for the Great Depression to occur again? And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, we came very, very close in 2008. But that may be another discussion. And so in our, in, in our time together this afternoon, I want to look at this idea of, again, this obsession on the idea of one cause of the Great Depression the stock market failing, and a further simplification that the failure of the stock market was all due to fear. There's an element of that, but again, that is also not going to be the whole story. So then what is kind of, what, what do we believe the current understanding of what happened to the, uh, the, the cause of the Great Depression? Part of it was speculation, 
uh, that there was a speculation, but it leads to what economists refer to as an asset bubble. An asset bubble is the irrational increase in the market price of an asset. And a couple of things to understand about that definition. One, it's irrational, right? It does not make sense. It is not based in fact. It's not based in using all available information intelligently and, and wisely. Instead, it is an irrational increase. The market prices keep going up and up and up. But why? Why do those asset bubbles come about? Well, economists oftentimes describe it as the greater fool theory. Right? The greater fool theory, very simply, is I go out and I buy an asset. Right? I buy this clock for $5. Right? I buy the clock for $5 because previously the price on the clock was $4. And so now I've seen the price of the clock increase to $5. So I buy the clock at a price of $5 because I think there's a bigger idiot out there than me who's going to buy it from me at $6. Right? Thus the name, greater fool theory. You believe that there's a greater fool than you that is going to buy the asset from you at a higher price than you purchased it. Right? This, this asset, this thing of value, could be everything from stocks to houses to the original example of tulip bulbs in Holland in the 16th century. Right? Why do people believe that the price is going to increase? It is most often because the price has increased in the past. And to believe that the price of something is going to continue to increase in the future because it increased in the past is irrational. There is no reason to believe that. Right? Just because something has gone up in the past does not mean it's going to continue to increase. Right? It's, it's irrational. So how then right, can this happen, and why is it that, that the market doesn't correct itself? Or when it corrects itself, it doesn't do it smoothly. We also believe that asset bubbles oftentimes come about when there is an easy access to credit. Right? And you've already heard this described a couple of times during the 1920s over, over the last few days, right? about how there was this increased ease of access, most often to consumers. Consumers have the ability to buy automobiles on credit. Right? In the 1920s, we also see them buying radios on credit, really for the first time. But let's not blame consumers only. Right? This was not just consumers borrowing, borrowing, arguably now we know excessively. This is also happening a great deal across financial markets. People were able to borrow, it's called buying stocks on the margin, where you're borrowing money to buy stocks. And then what was happening is the stock price was increasing. Why? Greater fool theory, right? You buy RCA stock at $10, now it increases to 12. Well, prices are clearly going to continue to go up because look how they've increased in the past. So you could, back in those days, you could then use the RCA stock, which has increased in value, to go borrow more money. You go to borrow more money, you, borrow, you buy more RCA stock. See what a genius I am? The price of RCA stock increased. Well, yes, because there are thousands of people like you doing the exact same thing. Right? So the price is going up and up and up, then starts this story of everybody saying, hey, you got to get into the stock market. You see how much prices have increased? You're like, oh, geez, I, I, I hope I haven't missed that train. Right, the prices are going up. I better get in now while the prices are low because they're certainly going to increase. Why? Well, because the prices have increased in the past. No. Right? That's the greater fool theory. But who is going to be there to sound the wake-up call? Right? Who is there to take the punch bowl away from the party when everybody is drinking from the punch bowl of the asset bubble of prices increasing and increasing and increasing? Right? You that's why you need also some type of regulation, oversight in the market, right, to control this, what John Maynard Keynes referred to as the animal spirits of business people. I updated it. He called them businessmen, but it was the 1920s, right, that they act like a herd of animals, right? We, we, we just, uh, we, business people will oftentimes do what they see other business people doing. The problem is, is that herd can oftentimes go off the cliff. And that's what happens when those asset bubbles, those prices that are increasing and increasing and increasing, the asset bubbles pop. Why do they pop? We don't know. We, we, we don't know. But we know that they do pop. And when they pop, those prices drop even more quickly than, than they went up. And huge amounts of wealth are destroyed. And as we'll talk about, when this happens in a financial market, 
it, it, it has these huge negative repercussions across the entire economy. So we know that these asset bubbles have existed. They're very, very difficult to predict. And I mean, I've, I've narrowed it down to three bullet points, but the honest, the honest truth is we as economists are still struggling to try to understand these things. We're struggling to understand them in the past, so please don't expect us to predict them. We can't, we just can't. We're still debating about what caused the Great Depression. But there, there will be another asset bubble. It's not an if, it's a, it's a will. And so watch out for these kind of canaries in the coal mine of everybody saying things, well, this time it's different, right? This time it's different, though no, the prices are always gonna keep going up and up. No, it's not really all that different. And this is the power of understanding the past, of how it can give us such good insight into what's gonna happen in the future. And when the asset bubbles pop, and people lose confidence, right, Bez, as they were all getting on that train as prices were increasing. Well, now they're jumping off the train like crazy. There's this huge drop in confidence. You need to restore the confidence, but you also have to do more. We can't just go back to the way things were. We also have to look at how did we get into this mess and how are we gonna make sure that we, ca that we do not do it again. And there are certain institutional factors that need to be adjusted to make sure that we don't create more and more asset bubbles. And that is, if we got time, we'll talk a little bit about what they did after the Great Depression and why we, for, for several decades after the Depression, did not have another major stock market meltdown. We did not have another major financial crisis. Unfortunately, times have changed. So part of it, yes, there was speculation in the stock market. There's no doubt about that. But the poor risk analysis of not understanding that prices can go down even more quickly than they've gone up was simply not limited to the stock markets on Wall Street. We also have to understand that the collapse of the financial system across the United States in the late 1920s and the early 1930s was exactly that. It was a failure of the entire financial system, not just of the stock market, right? Not to let the stock market off the proverbial hook. But we also saw many commercial banks across the country making unwise loans, not simply to stock market regulate, uh, to, to stock market participants. We also saw them in rural areas making essentially unwise agricultural loans. Part of what was happening in the 1920s is we had all of this, 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 this increase in productivity in, in agriculture, right? There was uh, uh, increased use of machinery and so on. And so the level of output for each farmer was increasing significantly, which was great for each individual farmer. But economists refer to this as the fallacy of composition. And that is what might be good for one if everyone does it it can be destructive, right? You see this oftentimes if you're, well, out on I-35, right? You're driving along and the sign says, you know, right lane closed ahead. <coughs> all right, what should we all do? Get out of the right lane, <coughs> you know? But eventually you'll have somebody who will go right up to the orange barrels, put on the directional and then just cut in, right? And, they, and for that one person, right, it's advantageous because you'll get some sucker, like me, who will stop and wave them in. So they get ahead of everybody else. That's, a, that's good for that one person. They got ahead of everybody else. But now if lots of people do that, and lots of people get into the right lane and go right up to the orange barrel, what do we have? The city of Chicago, right? Everything gets congested. So what's good and beneficial for one, <coughs> excuse me, has dire consequences if everyone does it. And that's what was happening in agriculture. We are greatly increasing the amount of agricultural production, but for most farmers, so thus what was happening is there's this overproduction, so prices were falling and falling and falling. And so what was happening is the bankers should have recognized this, right? But they didn't. They didn't, and they kept making kind of basically unwise agricultural loans and, and, and the, the results in the depletion of the soil that goes on, the Dust Bowl, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the bad lending was not limited to small and rural areas. We also know there is a lot of what we use under the catchphrase of crony capitalism, that loans were based, made not on risk analysis, not based on what is the probability that the borrower is going to repay, 
but it was more based on who's your father? Who's your father? How rich are you? Are you a well-connected family? Then you get the loan. If you're not, hmm, sorry, go away. And so what was happening is we we're also seeing in the 1920s this growing and growing wealth inequality in the 1920s. Right? And we know one of the things that's driving this is this very discriminatory lending that's going on in the banking system, what we just use as crony capitalism. If you're well connected, you get the loans, you, then that allows you to spend. So spending keeps going, and that is ultimately going to give the, the perception that the, econ well, the economy is growing and expanding, but it's an asset bubble. So we also have to address right, the structure of the financial system. How is risk analyzed, and when those bankers make bad loans, right? how then is that addressed, and how can you make sure that they don't make those bad loans again and again and again? Right? This is something that kind of misses the story of, well, it was just all stocks, stock market speculation. Another issue that we as economists don't really fully understand is the collapse of international trade. I mean, we understand the collapse of international trade, but we don't understand directly how that directly and why that seemingly oftentimes coincides with these economic and financial collapses. Right, what was happening in both in the United States and Europe, we were both pursuing what was called mercantilist policies. Mercantilism is a very, very old school of thought dating back to the 15th and 16th century, where the way that a country can grow in wealth and in power is through exports. Right, the idea if you export more than you import, right, then your trading partners are going to have to pay you. Right? They're going to have to pay you in the old days it was with gold or silver. Right? So uh, the idea behind mercantilism is, well, if you export a lot to your trading partners and in the extreme you don't import anything, they're going to have to pay you with something else. They're going to have to pay you with their gold or with their silver. Right? And so that's the way you can accumulate wealth. You export as much as you possibly can and import as little as you can. <coughs> uh, we know that that's not true. Right? Adam Smith, writing in 1776, labeled his book an inquiry into the causes of the wealth of nations, deliberately countering the mercantilist idea. And that the, you know, the way countries trade is through, you know, basically do what you do best and you buy the rest. But when you do that, there's going to be certain implications within the country that you have to address, which we haven't in the 21st century, but that, again, is a whole other topic we can have. In the 1920s, it was thought that with the problems in agriculture, right, we're overproducing like crazy, and we've got a lot of automation, we've got huge amounts of increase in output going on. Well, if we could just export everything, a lot of this excess production, to the Europeans and not import anything from them, our economy would continue to grow. <laughs> Europeans thought the same thing. Uh, and and, and they, they tried to export a lot to us through devaluation of their currencies. The problem with mercantilism is that it works in the short run. If you erect trade barriers, you impose tariffs, you subsidize your industries, it will work. It does lead to an increase in output, and this is why short-term focused politicians, and, and especially business people, will want these things. Right? They want tariffs. They want one-sided trade. Today, it's not about exporting and getting gold and silver from your trading partners. Today, it's jobs. Right? We believe that if we export as much as we possibly can, import as little as we can, we'll create jobs. The problem is, is while it works in the short run, it's a disaster in the long run. Right? The analogy I oftentimes use is like, given, you, know, you, you have a lethargic kid. I don't want to do anything. I don't have any energy. All right, so what are you going to do? Well, here, Junior, have a donut. All right, so you pound a donut down the kid's throat. Woo, he's on a sugar high. He's running around. He's doing all sorts of stuff. <coughs> yeah, but then what's going to happen? You keep doing that, keep doing that. Boom, he's going to drop over. You keep doing it, keep doing it. Boom, he's going to drop over into a diabetic coma. All right, same thing happens with economies. While mercantilism, right, this is working in the 1920s for us. The economy is booming, right? The economy is, grow is it looks like it's doing very well. Right? We're feeding an asset bubble. Problem is the Europeans are doing the same thing. So we start with the McCumber tariffs in 1923. We've got the now infamous Smoot-Hawley tariffs, which were being debated in 1929 and put in place in 1930. 
And even though international trade in the 1920s and 30s was a relatively small component of GDP, or, of, of the total economy, and so that's led some to economists to say, well, you know, mathematically it doesn't make sense, right, that a collapse of international trade would have this major impact in, in destroying the whole economy. Remember, we lose 40 percent, 40 percent of GDP, and that's probably underestimated. During the Great Depression, what role did international trade play? We're still struggling with that. We know that it plays an important role, but it seems like even a little bit of disruption in the international trading system can have this compounding effect and, again, was a major contributor to the Great Depression. Another cause of the Great Depression, again, an institutional structure that really failed us, was the Federal Reserve. Right? The Federal Reserve, the Central Bank and Monetary Authority of the United States, <coughs> was established in 1913, begins operation in 1914, and it was, in it was in reaction to the most previous financial crisis we had, which was the Panic of 1907, which is a very interesting story. Um, but, uh, uh, but that was ended by uh, Pierpont Morgan and, uh, uh, and, and his friends. So we realized that uh, allowing our financial system to be on the whim of one person didn't make such a great idea, so we created the Federal Reserve in 1913. But it was a very weak structure, and so it was uh, basically run by Benjamin Strong out of, the, out of the New York Fed. The problem is Benjamin Strong dies in 1928, and it leaves the Fed leaderless. So if you're interested in kind of the failure of, 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 of structures, of, of hierarchical structures, the, the death of Benjamin Strong and, and the, the pff, yeah, I'll call it a, I'll get, put it in writing, so I'll call it it, the failure of the Federal Reserve. The, the Fed was supposed to be a lender of last resort, right? That when there is a financial crisis, they are supposed to lend money like crazy. They're supposed to greatly increase the growth rate of the money supply, right? Um, to, to quote, the, the, the famous lyrics uh, from the 1980 so, uh, 1989 song, Pump Up the Jam. <laughs> Pump up the jam. Pump up the jam, yo. Pump up the jam. If you simply replace the word jam with money supply, you'll understand what the Federal Reserve is supposed to do. Pump up the money supply, keep it going. Pump up the money supply, yo. Pump up the money supply. They didn't. They contracted it. And so it, it, it's, kind of the, it's kind of like you see a fire. Well, we have a fire. Let's use gasoline. Yes, throw gasoline on the fire, and the gasoline will smother out the flames. And it blows up on you. Like, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. So no, you don't go contractionary. You don't try to raise interest rates, right, when things are weak and the, and, 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 and the financial markets are falling apart. But that's exactly what the Federal Reserve did. There was a huge, huge failure of, of leadership because they were following um, dogma. Now, a dogma, of course, is, is oftentimes for, for religious uh, 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 concepts, but it also works in economics. Right? Dogma is where, where the, the leaders state something and people just, just follow what the leaders are saying really without kind of thinking about it. And the dogma of the real, bill, real bills doctrine was that banks should lend money only if it was used for real economic activity. Okay, well, what does that mean? What's real economic activity? So it meant, right, real economic activity like production or retail and not speculative purposes. And so speculative purposes were like buying stocks. So what was happening is when things were falling apart and the banks turn to the Federal Reserve and they say, hey, look, we, uh, we are banks. We have all these depositors who want our funds and <laughs> we don't have any. Um, so Federal Reserve, you're supposed to be the lender of last resort. Please lend us money. And the Federal Reserve said, well, now, now, now wait a minute. Hmm. According to the real bills doctrine, I'm only supposed to lend you money if this money will be used for real economic activity. So if I as the Federal Reserve, if I lend you money, is that gonna go to real economic activity or might it go to hmm, speculation? And the banks are like, dude, I don't know what the depositors are gonna do with the money. They just want their freaking money. They might eat, all right? Lend me the money. And the Federal Reserve is like, hmm, yeah, well, you can't guarantee me that it's not going to go for speculative behavior, so I'm not going to lend you money. And so the Federal Reserve actually closed the discount window. They refused to lend money to the banks when the banks were having all the depositors lining up, right, and wanting their money back. It was a failure of our institution. 
the Federal Reserve failed to be a lender of last resort. So while there was a huge amount of fear that was going on, right, the bigger issue was that we also had a failure of the institutions, had a failure of the Federal Reserve, had a failure of the international trading system, had a failure of, of, of our banking system. And as I mentioned earlier, the problem, and again, we as economists only really over the last uh, couple of decades have begun to realize this, this financial multiplier that collapses in financial markets can and do have much bigger and longer lasting negative impacts on the economy than, than, than the causes of other economic downturns. Say things like a natural disaster, right, will have a negative impact on the economy, no doubt about it, right, whether that's a, a hurricane, earthquake, or something like that. But nothing, nothing compares to what happens when you have a financial market collapse. You get into these inflationary death spirals where deflationary is where the price level is going down and down and down. And when the price levels are falling, you think that sounds like a good idea. Things are getting cheaper. But no, actually, when, when, when you have a deflationary uh, 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 pressures, it, it increases the real burden of debt. Give you a real quick example. Let's suppose you borrow $100. You borrow $100, and your hourly wage is $10 an hour. All right? So that means it takes you 10 hours to pay back the $100 debt. You with me? Now assume that there's deflation. The price level of everything is falling, but your amount of debt doesn't go down, right? But your wages will go down. So you got the $100 debt. You used to have an hourly wage of $10 an hour. Now your wages are only $5 an hour. So now making only $5 an hour, it's going to take you 20 hours to repay that debt. See how the real burden of debt increases when there's deflation? So when there's deflation or even the threat, even the threat of deflation, that prices are going to go down. People will stop, people in firms will stop borrowing. If firms don't borrow, they can't employ people, right? They can't employ people. They're going to start selling their goods at a lower price. Prices are going to go down again and again and again. That's why another thing to watch, boy, when, 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 when you start hearing this talk about deflation, we're in big, big trouble. Again, the solution to it is your central bank has to increase the money supply, right? They've got to lend money like crazy. So the other thing, the final thing that, again, one of the things that uh, economists also have for uh, really since the Great Depression, this is now changing with the uh, rise of behavioral economics, are these expectations of how expectations can become these self-fulfilling prophecies that if people become concerned and worried about things, it, it can cause bad things to happen. So in many ways, FDRs, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, is economically accurate. But let me also be clear about this. Controlling the fear and getting people to have confidence without the institutional changes are not going to be enough. Right? You need the institutional changes, meaning institutions like the financial system, the international trading system, the Federal Reserve, to also be sure right, that the economy can pick up and can recover. And so it's all these different moving parts, right? The problems of the collapse of international uh, 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 trading system, the collapse of the banking system. Yes, the speculation in the stock market, right? But it's also the problems with agriculture. It's also the problems with asset bubbles, right? It's all those things together that cause the Great Depression. And so to only focus on one aspect of it, the stock market collapse and saying that that then caused the banking crisis is frighteningly oversimplistic. And so I think by taking your students through it and to, to what depth you want to take them is, is, is left up to you, but to get them to understand that like our life, our economy is complicated and is sophisticated and be very, very careful of thinking that they're just very simple solutions, right? That there are no silver bullets to solve our problems whether that's in our lives or whether that's within our economic system. Thank you very much.